Daniel Paulson, you're doing the introduction today and we're, of course, joined with a wonderful guest and it's all yours, Daniel. Well, thank you, Patrick. We got Carolyn Meyer, uh, multiple freediving champion from Brazil and we also got our master instructor, Juliana Del Corso, with us. So, uh, welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, uh well i'm i'm uh, you know two uh two people from brazil so it'd be very interesting we've had a lot of swedish people on so far so i'm very very excited to to talk to somebody who's a free diver who's really mastered uh the breath so uh normally caroline uh, we start off uh, before we get into free diving with your background so could, could you tell us how you uh, a little bit about your background and how you ended up uh, doing free diving. Okay, so I'm very glad to be here to be invited for you guys. And I'm a fan of Oxygen Adventures, so since the beginning. Um, and well, well, when I well was a child, I I always loved the water, but the the crucial point when I decided to compete was when I could unite my passion for the water, for I united it to the other sports because I love it to practice several sports in my life. So when I found free diving, I united these two passions. Mm -hmm. And then I started to training when I was 20 years old, mm -hmm. 28 years old. And how, how did you get into, and how did you know that you were, I know we've actually talked before, and that you were, you had a, you had some sort of talent uh, from the, from the first no. time. Um, I dive, uh, I did my dives without count the, the death or the time. But uh, when I, I always go to the, went to the sea with the guys, the spear fishing guys. And mm -hmm. the spear fishing guys told me that, I stayed, I stood longer than them mm -hmm. and, but I never, I never pay, pay attention about it, but they told me and one day they requested me to do a, a, an apnea in front of them and I did the four minutes, almost four minutes for my first time and after that I started to looking for the champions around the world and I found the French people and I started to talk with the world champion and the Lesos from Reunion Island and I decided to start to training and talking by emails and with the French group and one day they invited me to go to France to training and I went for three months Next year, the, the other year, I went for more three months, and then I never stopped the training. Yeah. Then and I reached the world. How happens. old were you? What age when this happened? Twenty eight, twenty nine. So that was a, a hidden talent for many years, because most people who become a world champion in anything, they normally they know at, when they're teenagers or younger that they're very good at whatever sport and they practice football. Like I know in Brazil, everybody plays football, but tennis or ice hockey or whatever sport. But at 28, that is, that is very late. Must, must have been very exciting to know that you, you had such a talent for freediving. I also, I think that freediving, you do not require you an explosion or an aerobic um, uh, hypertrophic muscles or an aerobic mm. system too much. Uh, mm. In the beginning, you need a lot of aerobic level training, mm. and you don't. It, young people is a little bit nervous than the old people, a little bit stressed, and don't control a lot the the state of mind. So when you are a little bit older, and you understand better many situations, then your psychological side is better than a young people mm. normally so you you are more able to accept many situations that freediving imposed to you yeah because i think it's 
potentially one of the hardest sports really in the world because uh, any other sport, <laughs> you can kind of get off the train when you feel like, okay, it's not working today. But once you're at a hundred meters depth, you can't really say, okay, I'm done. You, you kind of, <laughs> you, you, you roll the dice. So, so it's, it's, it's uh, very interesting how you can control and be relaxed because if you're not relaxed, you use up your oxygen. So it's, it's, uh, you have to be able to relax on demand in a very tough environment. So that's, uh, how do you manage to do that? Um, in the beginning, I try to control the breath is very important. And um, many people think that uh, the most important thing for free diving is the lung of the sides. Mm -hmm. But it's not at all. And it's not a, a little, a little bit of all the the most important part of the free diving is about how to breathe better outside the water and how to breathe in a cellular situation, not only put air inside a big lung. So I learned a lot to how to do this bre cellular breathing mm -hmm. and and it was very important also for me for free diving this this part how to learn how to breathe but mainly the cellular respiration mm. oh, wouldn't you say patrick that this goes hand in hand with oxygen advantages in so far as how you breathe throughout the day and throughout the night the 20, 23 hours plus mm. and then you had the adaptation phase with, with yeah with i love i love hearing that sentence and um, that it was your breathing outside of the water that influenced your breathing inside the water like, Caroline, that's pretty amazing. I've measured, oh, I don't know, maybe 8,000 people's breath hold times. And I can tell you one thing, nobody ever presented four minutes straight off the bat. <laughs> and I understand it was a maximum breath hold. But even still, it's a pre you weren't hyperventilating before that, were you? you? Did you have normal breathing? And then you breathe in and held your breath for as long as you can? Or did you breathe out? And Can you remember your first apnea? That you did with the spirit fisherman in the in the beginning, I did a, a high hyperventilation. Oh, you did hyperventilation, <laughs> high, very, yeah, very high. Now I know how to do it. Uh, I'd also in the beginning was a, a kind of a disaster, a panic, uh, uh, apnea. <laughs> so mm. it was completely wrong. Now I what I do is short apneas, I breathe well outside the water. I do short apneas to induce the diving reflex, to induce the cellular respiration. And these short apneas prepare myself to long balance long. also the, 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 the parasympathetic side of the mind. And then I know that I'm able to, to free dive. Then I do two or three short free diving to just to improve the, the diving reflex. And then I, I'm sure that I, what I, I will do my best in the best conditions. Then. So in the beginning was completely a um, uh, disaster because I did a big hyperventilation. I, I always go outside the water close to a blackout, always, because due to the, the CO2 level so low, and you're, I, you're when I try levels. to... <coughs> yes, you, when I, sorry, you when, hyperventilate to get your CO2 level so low. And yes, then you, so low, yes. and when I, when I feel one contraction, it's time to breathe immediately because I was in a very low oxygen level. Yes. Always, mm. always. Yeah. Um, just a diving reflex because some of our listeners may not be familiar with it. Are you talking specifically about the spleen or is there other Two. effects? Also, the spleen contractions, you can have it uh, without touch the water. But the first, the, the first reflex was the short apneas outside the water, exactly to do it, this mm. plane contraction. Mm -hmm. But also to train the, the rib cage to be stop is also a kind of warm up for us because we hold 
short up nails we hold uh, and the the rib cage expand and then you are telling to the brain that it will start the short up nails the brain is ready to the the biggest up in air, the your maximum and then you touch the water when you touch the water you have this place around your eyes this place when you you touch the water, you feel the body start to improve the vessels con contractions. This yes. <clears throat> yes. So your blood vessels and are your peripheral blood circulation constricts. Yes, contracts to, to conserve blood flow and oxygen for the yeah. the brain and to the protect. heart. protect. Yes, to protect lungs, brain, and heart. So the bradycardia too mm -hmm. so we have our body start to to be more economic mm -hmm. to take more oxygen for the main organs that is yes. the the diving reflex yes doesn't yes. matter does it go down i mean the diving reflex you get a stronger one if you have colder water so what yeah. would, what would be the yeah. optimal temperature for you to dive in for a free diving world record? Would you go to a place where it's a little bit cooler, like ten or fifteen Celsius? I I prefer. Um, I always use a wetsuit because you can't feel cold, but you must feel cold around here. Okay. It's the most important part, okay. not ar around all the body, but around here is very important. What does, this what does that do? Difference. Sorry? What what does that do? Is it stimulating your vagus nerve or so? is it stimulating the vagus? Yes, two. Two. It's also this difference around this uh, ocular globe mm. is the is one kind of stimulation. Okay. That's good. Cool. Mammalian response, right? The people the, the scientists discover that um uh, 40 years ago that if you are with your clothes but if you put only your face in the water you can check this kind of uh, diving reflex because the main part is around the, the eyes mm. it's amazing yeah. so there's something really yes. natural and normal for human beings to dive it's it's almost it's an essential part of our evolution yeah Many, many scientists tell that it's because the diving reflex, many scientists tell that uh, we have a region mm. from the water and because all of us have this kind of reflex, not only for diving athletes, we just mm. have it more acute. The mammalian response, right? The name? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's the same. So it's interesting that you are using some of the same techniques that we are introducing to the athletes, uh, you know, to simulate high altitude training to get the spleen contraction. But you take it obviously a step further because you do, when you do free diving, you get the mammalian response. But you also do static apnea outside the, yeah. the water as well. And then do you, if you do that, do you still dip your head in water to get the, the reflex or you're you're not allowed to do it no um i when i'm i don't have some people to to be my safety i normally train outside the water yeah and i know that it's strongest than training in the water and um I also, I have the spleen contractions, but I don't have the diving reflex. But that is why it's very difficult to train outside the water. Mm -hmm. It's a strong dive for us. And yeah. sometimes I decided to train outside exactly because I will find a strong training for me. Yeah. And we have a many, several exercises to improve um, the training as you told me about this altitude training yeah. that you have. Yeah. It's almost similar because yeah. we improve this hematocrit. Hematocrit? He hematocrit. Um, mm. Yes. yes. <laughs> and 
we do we do it exactly to improve the our performance outside your, the water too. Your oxygen carrying capacity. Um, do you yes. mind if I ask you what what your hematocrit would be? Do you get it tested, or is it just information you wish to hold on to for yourself? Sorry. What what would um, a typical free diver hematocrit be? So normally for a female, it's between thirty six to forty four percent. No, it's bigger. <laughs> it's bigger. No, for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, my my level is around 43, 44. Yes. And then when you go to the water, you must pay attention because if you are not, uh, you are not hydrated, well hydrated, yes. then the level can be higher. Yes. So we pay attention to and about in, it. In, our, in, our, in the in the man, I mean, oxygen advantage uh, manual. We there's a lot of examples. Uh, about and, and research on, on free diving. And I think one is saying that it's actually a permanent increase for a lot of free divers with a hematocrit value of 5% in uh, units, which rings well with what you're saying, 44. So 5% higher than a normal uh, woman. Yeah. So, so you, you don't have just a temporary, which you get from the spleen contraction. You also have a permanent from all those years of practice, it seems. Uh, maybe it's lower now, I don't know, but, but it seems like you, you get both a, a temporary and a permanent chip. So yeah. that's interesting. Um, would you say that uh, people are using, any free divers use hyperventilation now? Or is that something only back in the good old days when, when people use, or they just try to relax now with different techniques? It's an old technique uh, for sure, because it's uh, dangerous. And then today we avoid it uh, we just pay attention about exactly to to the the main part is the relaxation mm -hmm. and we call our ventilations a, a kind of a super ventilation then i try to to spend no more than three minutes breathing um we have the mask around the face so we need to breathe through the mouth right. okay that we so can what is a super breathe through the nose. A super ventilation is um, a ventilation that is not the, exactly the, the, the necessary for the moment. It's a little bit more, a little bit more, but okay. not a big ventilation. So we pay attention to don't be tired, the rib cage tired. Yes. Don't elevate the heartbeat and balance the nervous system to don't be too much relaxed and not too much stressed because you must be focused to go down yeah. and you must be prepared to the maximum. So you can't stress it a lot outside and start to dive tired. Hmm. So we pay attention a lot about it. So the super ventilation is something about a special ventilation, not so calm, not so parasympathetic, but uh, hmm. we hmm. try to up, we use the belly. I normally use the belly and a little bit upper hmm. and a little, the rhythm is important because I change the rhythm to getting the focus uh, state, the rhythm uh, interfere on it. Not mm. this, I don't use the, all the lung during this moment is one or two minutes. Mm. And, but the rhythm, it's a little bit strong and I faster. pay attention as yes, faster. Mm. And I pay attention about the signals to the CO2 level is not so low low because to don't be in a hyperventilated state so it's that okay, this is really interesting daniel because yeah. achieving a flow state is something that's not just for beneficial to free diving but it's this is for any person you know yeah and um, we have our own routine in terms of we activate the body's relaxation response first and we do it by breathing light, <clears throat> by breathing slow and by breathing low. 
and this is a calming effect on the mind. And then we do two easy breath holds and five strong breath holds to get spleen contraction. And maybe just before a person goes out onto a game, they, they exhale some carbon dioxide from the mouth just to lower any acidity. And I think we're all looking to replicate flow states and you're doing it slightly different. So it sounds as if you're increasing the respiratory rate so it's that little bit faster, but the tidal volume, which is the size of each breath, it doesn't seem as if you're changing that. In other words, you're not having an effect on minute ventilation. It's, it's, it's a faster respiratory rate, but you're keeping, are you keeping the, the tidal volume, which is the size of each breath, a little bit more or a little bit less or the same? I'm just wondering the effect on the overall minute ventilation, what impact is it having? I think on the tidal, a little bit bigger than the tidal volume. Yes, a little bit normal. bigger. Yeah. So you're, so you're slightly hyperventilating, but you're doing it controlled yes. that your carbon dioxide levels don't go down too much. And yes. the reason being is because if your CO2 levels are too low, if you go into the water, you're not going to feel the sensation to breathe. So you, there's a risk of underwater blackout. Is that the main yeah. reason? Yeah. Yes, yes. But we pay yeah. a lot of attention. Uh, we are very far from uh, hyperventilation. Very far. Yes, yes. It's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, free divers must be the ones who are mostly in tune with their breathing before they're going in. So it seems to me that there's, the, you know, you, you, you reduce your CO2 slightly versus if you're a different if you're a tennis player or a football player you would increase it slightly because you don't you know you want to get an increase a slight air hunger before this so you're you're moving the other way slightly so it's all about calibrating the stress level because i i'm sure that you're very stressed in you know in, before you go down 100 meters so you, you need to be able to handle that in various ways but i don't think there's any sport where you're that uh, meticulous about your breathing before because it's mm -hmm. it's the, it's mm -hmm. everything that that's what you're doing but ironically you don't breathe you hold your breath so yeah so so, yeah. so i think the sports world could learn a lot any totally. sport really totally um can i ask two questions because they're bugging me now one is <laughs> what what do you think allows you to hold your breath for so long what factors do you think are playing a role? Relaxation is one factor, the cognitive component, surrendering into the air hunger and being able to cope with that feeling of suffocation. There are other factors as well, Caroline. Have you ever thought about what factors are allowing you to have such a long breath hold? Do you think it's CO2 tolerance? Do you think it's discomfort signals from the diaphragm? Um, what do you think is going on? You have a spleen contraction, which allows you to, I don't know. So what do you think? Um, I think uh, the training, the acceptation of the contractions is a mental training too. Uh, this part of the, the mental training is very important because when you start to, to training and you feel the urge to breathe, it's a kind of, uh, you chalk shock state because when you feel it you feel immediately that you will die if you don't breathe mm. so you start to accept it you start to understand so you change psychologically because you know what is the contraction you know what is happening and you want to do it to do a performance so it's a it's a very important moment when you can improve, when you decide to improve. So you have the first part that, that is a chemical adaptation. The CO2 and the, O2, the oxygen level are a chemical adaptation for your body. Then the psychological adaptation becomes with the information and how do you understand the process? And also, how do you accept? How do you accept the suffering moment? And how do you accept the pressure 
the water pressure and how do you focus on what you need to do so you must the training is very complex but the mind guides you and the body just to adapt with this chemical and the and the water pressure too what happens underwater we have um, other problems is uh, issues underwater like uh, narcosis and you must control it and you will control it with your mind it's very difficult moment when you cross 40 meters and went to 120 meters you have uh, your synapses in your mind your brain start to fail and you start to see and imagine things you start to hear noises and it's very difficult to keep the focus so the mind uh, is always the main part so that is why many times i my in my training days i i use it to train the apnea but also the mind together thinking about the dive i try to visualize the the whole dive always this both training is very important to improve so i think uh, i in the beginning um i had a a good co2 tolerance because without training i i realized that i accepted the contractions since the beginning that is why uh, a kind of uh, skill that I, that I had in the past. But the others, even if you have skills, but if you don't train and if you don't accept the conditions and if you are not strong in your mind, you don't go beyond. So how many hours per day or how often did you train when you were at your peak level? You, you can be effective without many hours, many hours. Mm -hmm. uh, if you train well, correctly, I, I think two hours is enough, is enough. If you balance during the week, uh, all the, the training is not always the same, but if you balance it, then I think two hours is enough, enough. Mm -hmm. So, and do you, do you do other types of training like physical training, like uh, uh, in addition and swimming and so on? Is, or is oh, that I, I love it to, to cycling. So I, I, I practice cycling six days per week. So inside, when I'm cycling, I train in free diving too, free, because we move the, you have this, you, you must move your legs and yeah. it's very similar to the when you kick your fins. Okay. So it's very nice training, and you can do aerobic and aerobic training, cycling. Mm. So I love to cycling. I love to um, bodyboarding, and um, I love also running. I love yoga. Uh, <laughs> if you leave me to do everything that I want to do. <laughs> How, I don't have a time to do everything. <laughs> so one thing that's very interesting to me is, uh, I mean, these are uh, one of those sports that I, I don't think anybody really can relate to, to deep diving if you haven't done it yourself. So could you take us through like up to when you were trying to set a world record, like the day before, uh, uh, with, even with sleep, which is a big interest to us, because uh, you would be maybe a little bit uh, nervous. So what would you be doing in the 24 hours leading up to an event? Because uh, that would be very interesting to know. Uh, I think uh, one month before I changed it, I start to change uh, to, to the goal, to do it. So the, I, I have a plan mm -hmm. and I try to improve uh the sleep how many hours is sleeping sleeping very well i pay attention a lot about it mm -hmm. i take serious for serious the the, yeah. the sleep 
and um, around three days before I avoid to eat uh, steak or I just eat pasta and I avoid to caffeine and other drinks, yes, and sleep well, sleep well all the time. Then I try to control, I do the exercise to be relaxed. I like a lot mantras to the exercise for the mind to, to take the mind stable. And I like to repeat the mantras because put me in a, a real calm state. Yeah. So I pay attention with breath. And if I find some sign of stress, I do a short apneas. Around 20 or 30 seconds, 10 short apneas, and I get into a nice state again. Because I'm also, um, I I realize that I'm nervous and I try, the difference is that you can control, you can feel it and control it. And that is what I do. So I also feel nervous, but uh, I try to do it. Sleep well and short apneas. If I feel out of control, then I stop and the, uh, Short up in the air, and I put me in the in my calm state again. Yeah, and, and what about when is it the most nervous moment? Is it like a few hours before, the night before, or right before you do the diet? Right before you will be in a, <laughs> a bad situation. So <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> you have a uh, moments then you. You have adrenaline moments hours before. So you have uh, some moments that you feel, oh God, then you control, you feel God, you control again. So when you go to the, to the, the record minutes before, you are in a flow state, I think. Because you are in a flow state, it's and state that um, anything can interfere anymore. Mm. You, I'm closer to do it. So when I'm putting my wetsuit, when I start to do my, my warm ups, I'm completely involved to do it. Mm. Nothing right. interferes anymore. You're probably, I would say, then at the borderline of alpha and theta, or beta, I mean, uh, brain waves. So you're, you're, in, you're in that yeah. flow state. And would you say that, what it, do you know what your pulse rate is when you go in? And do you know how much it drops, your heart rate? How much it goes from like say 45 to 20 in the world? Do you know, have you? Have, yeah. Yes, when I did the records to Guinness book and I was doing the warm up, and I checked my heartbeat. My heartbeat is around 43 in the morning but uh, I, what I do is short up in airs. I hold my breath with a full length, but also I hold the, my breath with uh, um, empty length. And when I do the empty length, I had a 25 heartbeats per minute when I breathe out and hold the breath. So oh, it was my. the minimum. I ask you when you breathe out and hold your so when you breathe in and hold your breath you you fill your lungs and hold your breath and if you breathe out do you breathe in do you breathe out to functional residual capacity is it a normal exhalation yes. normal exhalation yes. and then you hold your breath yes i don't force to breathe out it's yes, a, yes. a normal yes it's a passive expiration yes mm -hmm a passive ex expiration to FRC and you're holding the breath, but you're not doing a maximum. You're only holding the breath for short duration. No, you're, you're... no, I don't force. You don't force Sh short up in Yes, yes. And what, what's short for you? Short. 20, 30 seconds or how, how long would you say uh, in seconds that you hold your breath? In seconds with, without force, the expiration, I think uh, 45, 
45 seconds, no more, no more than this. The intention is not force. Okay. It's just to calm down and get into the diving reflex is the and, main purpose. And then you rest for how long? Like a minute or two? After, two. 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 And then you do two minutes. How, roughly how many times? How many times? I do. I do. I improve a little bit the, in the beginning. I do short apneas, two, three short apneas mm -hmm. with air and without air. And then I improve the warm ups until I feel the contraction. When I feel the contraction, I stop. Okay. And then the interval is bigger. It's around three or until five minutes. Okay. Between... And then I go to the maximum. Mm -hmm. so, so you build it up slowly to get to the level where you get contractions and then you stop. So you kind of yes. build it slowly, almost like you, you're walking, then you're jogging like the same to get your muscles, but now it's your breath. So once you feel it, you, you, you bring it down again. So it's supposed to be just pure relaxation when you do it. Okay, very, very interesting. Mm. Um, so uh, a, a very interesting question also, how does it feel <laughs> when you're at such a great depth. Is there a progression of feelings from the water level down to the bottom and then when you go up again? Is it possible to describe that feeling at, uh, during that? And how long does it take? Two to three minutes? Three, the, uh, when I reached uh, reach 121 meters, it was uh, a total dive time is three minutes, 15 seconds around it. But uh, what I think during this travel, and uh, well, first, I, I must pay attention about the technical issues like equalization. This mm -hmm. is the most important part. So I focus it on it because the speed improve and you can't lose the equalization. Mm -hmm. So I pay attention around my ears all the time to put air around my mouth because we change we must to have the a flexible diaphragm to put air inside the mouth to equalize the ears and it's very important for me then if i succeed and i improve the depth i start to feel like a I never open my eyes going down with the machine, never. Okay. So I just open my eyes on the bottom when the machine stops. And then I feel, then I open my eyes and I feel that, yes, I reach it. So it's a, um, an emotion, but uh, it's, you just per perceive that you are in a special place, a special yeah. place where you are, Nothing like I told yesterday. Yeah, yeah. You feel that you are united with the sea. You are nothing, but you are everything at the same time. It's a very strange sure. and good sensation. It's a good sensation. It's well, amazing. I've, I've heard and that. then you need to go up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. because yeah, I've heard somebody say it's the ultimate meditation to free dive. And I don't know, since I haven't done it myself, I don't know, but I, I from talking to you and just listen to other free divers, it seems, it seems like an uh, unbelievable experience when you go down to those steps. And do you get it every single time or could it be like every other time? Uh, or is it, do you always get it? Um, this sensation, you can feel it in a shallow water too. Okay. But you must to accept many things and you need to train it too. Yeah. Then when you start to free diving, you will really start to free diving, you will feel the sensation. Yeah. It's the treasure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Erlen, can I ask, in terms of people who start off free diving, do sometimes people overdo the breath holds? Because even when when we're working with we do breath holds of course and you know, you could be working with one person and their reaction to a breath hold is a lot stronger um, in, in terms of the panic and the feeling of suffocation that it can bring up trauma. Um, do, do, you, do you ever see people overdoing it with the breath hold? Sometimes it's a nice balance to get 
with breath holds, or do you think it's the the adapted training that helps the person adjust to the breath holding? I think uh, the the beginners for the beginners uh, when I'm doing the freediving course, I don't put the people directly in the water because. I do many exercises outside the water because I try to work with the breath, the mind, and the emotions too. Because it's everything is connected. Mm. So I give the information to try to um, to avoid the the for the beginners they they are very afraid of everything. So. When they are afraid, it affects the emotion, that affects the breath, that affects everything. It will affect the free dive too. So I work with them outside water and we do some stretching. Then we do the belly breath, the full breath. We do a relaxation. We do a relaxation in the water, floating. And then after that, we start with a hypercapnic training, short apneas in the water without the mask, so just to feel free in the water and accept the short uh, CO2 high levels, but short, not bigger. And then when they realize that they can reach 30 seconds or one minute and they are happy, so I try to do the next training that is a hypoxic training that is a little bit stronger. So step by step, yeah. I, I work with the skills and also the, the other problems that appear during the course because each student is different. So I, it's not a, a package. It's, it starts to be a personal um, uh, job for me because I, I need to work with each one differently. Yeah, in, in the Oxygen Advantage, we use the bold score as kind of a, a measurement for progression to see if That's you know. Nice. Uh, and do you have something similar? So, how, how would you know where a person is at so they can go down five meters or 10 meters or whatever? Yeah. Do, you, do you have some marker to know? Where yes. We, we try to consider in the beginning the first contraction, when the first contraction starts in the static apnea. It's a, a very important point for us. And how many contractions the student can accept in the beginning, it's important. But before feel the contractions, there is another adaptation. It's not do it to the CO2 level, high CO2 level. It's another adaptation that we need to, to have it. If you don't training and you stop the rib cage, we have a baro, barometric sensors and the brain is not adapted to feel your rib cage stop it. So the first training is short up in there just to Accept the rib cage, stop it. It's the first physiological response for apneas. If you don't move your rib cage, the brain will perceive it and send a message to breathe. But this message to breathe is not due to the high CO2 level. It's just because the rib cage is stopped. That is why in the beginning, I, I, I tell to the students to move the air from the lungs to the mouth without losing the air. And then the use to breathe and the contraction stop. So you say from the legs to the mouth? Yeah, we put the mm. air from the lungs to the mouth like that. Mm. And breathe again. Mm. Okay. Then you, you can reach one minute to 130. Seconds so this is in the be beginning. And then the real signal yeah. of the high CO2 appear. So Caroline, just to, to go back to that. So what you're saying is when you do a breath hold, 
your brain has interpreted that your ribs have stopped moving completely. And because your ribs have stopped moving, your brain is sending the impulse to breathe. So you're tricking your ribs by moving air from your lungs and back again. Yeah, yeah. this is it. We, we, we always kind of interpreted that it was the discomfort signals from the diaphragm that were sending a message through the brain which terminated the breath all the time. And there could be so many different things involved with this. It's, it's so complex. And yes, you know. It's, but it's a trick yeah. only for the beginning. Yes, okay. <laughs> it's just to surpass the, the very difficult moment in the beginning. Mm. It's very, very hard to cross the contraction, the use to breathe. Mm. And then if you do this trick, you feel more comfortable to, to go beyond a little bit. Mm. Do, do you think that by training people to surrender to the feeling of air hunger, that you build up their breath, that you build up their willpower and their stress coping ability outside of the free diving. So if you're working with a vulnerable, say for example, you're working with somebody who gets quite stressed quite easily and you're teaching them the ability to cope with air hunger and they are able to relax into this discomfort that then when they get a stressful event in their normal everyday life, that they can cope with it much better because they have trained their body and mind to be able to surrender. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, completely. Do you think so it is possible? I think, I think uh, um, um, Patrick, um, when you train free diving, you are able to control many situations outside the world. But mainly because what I told you in the beginning, and you control the breath, you control your mind, you control the energy. You can use your energy better. The whole body can do it. It's not only to do free diving. It's for your life. Yes. Yeah, it's for, it's, it's for the whole body. And this is very important. That is why... I think uh, um, teach free diving is beautiful, but teach how to breathe and it's amazing. Mm. What, what would you say are the main benefits for most people? Is it their general well-being, their ability to focus, happier? Like, what what is what do you see the main effects? Um. The, I think uh, what, I real, what I found in my courses in the, uh, for the beginnings is um, difficult to breathe better, mainly because they, they breathe short and through the mouth. And I think uh, all the people today are in a hyperventilated state outside the world. So I think the first great benefit is balance the CO2 again. Put the body in a, a healthy situation again. And then you can improve to do any sports. But first, you will improve the balance, the CO2 balance to oxygen the whole body better. And then we can we can start to do everything you want to do because you are breathing better again. You control it. Then, if you start to do the training, you will also apply the mental control because you are breathing in another rhythm. You know your thoughts. You can control your thoughts. You are not a a kind of slave of your emotion that destroy your breath, that destroy your body. So you have a, a key of that. You can control better your health, your thoughts, your emotions. I think uh, 
outside the water, I become a better human mm. because free diving offer me more than this. Offer me to learn how to breathe too. Mm. It's yeah. a para paradoxal. Yeah. It's paradoxal because you hold your breath, but to hold yes. your breath, you must to learn how to breathe better. Yeah. So you have to breathe correct in order to hold those long breath holds. So it seems to me that this could be beneficial for somebody who is depressed. Have you trained people who are depressed that can change their states, that get into these yeah, flow good. states? Uh, I don't know if they have breathing problems coming in, but it seems to me that it could be helpful. Yeah, yes, yeah. also. Yeah. Because uh, depressive people breathe very short also. Mm -hmm. Very short. So the ha happiness helps you to breathe better too. So the, the body position, the, the emotional state, uh, happiness state also contributes, contributes to you to breathe better. Mm. And also the pressure from the, from the water is also beneficial. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. So, yes, uh, completely. Yeah. So it, it, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated. It by very it. much makes sense. So in, in some ways, because when you can accustom, I think there's a number of, ha number of aspects here. One is the physiological change in response that you're able to hold your breath for longer. So your tolerance to CO2 buildup is better. Your tolerance to drop lower, lower oxygen is better. You're able to surrender. There's a psychological aspect in terms of surrendering to the feeling of air hunger, but when you have improved CO2 tolerance and a longer breath hold time, normally we see a slower respiratory rate and we see more breathing from the lower regions of the lungs using the diaphragm. And slow breathing and low breathing in turn then is going to help strengthen the bar reflex, which in turn then is improving vagal tone, which would be very, very helpful with people with mental, mental health issues. Um, I think there's a lot going on here. You know, we should watch a video of you doing a dive. Hmm. And yeah. because, you know, maybe we're talking about it. So, Caroline, I'm just going to do a share screen here. I'm not, I'm not sure even if this is a good one. It may not be. So do you see that one there? Yes. Do you, rec do you oh. recognize it? Is this so, in Italy? Is the Deep Joy... Yes, it's a, a drive at 40 meters and it, in Italy. Yeah, yeah. So the we, Ypsilon 40. We can barely see you. You're, you're down here and I'm not sure if you're, if you're on your way back up or if you're... Okay, so it's it's pretty impressive, um, to say the least. It, was that yeah? Was that a minute and twenty seven seconds? So, how much of a of an effort is that for you? Forty meters. Forty meters. Um, the speed is around one meter per second. It's around it. So one minute, one minute twenty, one minute thirty seconds to go down and come back again. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> that's oh, yeah. We have to try it out, Patrick, and see how it works out. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's for we sure. need to go to you first. We need to go there to that. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be baby steps, sir. Huh? <laughs> no, it's so cool. So yeah. cool. Um, yeah. In terms of Giuliano, you're a fellow country person with Caroline here, and uh, free diving is it uh, popular in Brazil? Yeah, I think it is right now. For me, it's, it's not so. I I, I like to to free dive, but I, I never tried a lot. No. You don't want to get into a competition, with Carl, I know. No, he's coming no. to my island. He's coming. <laughs> I'm coming to Florianópolis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll make the training with Carol also. Yeah. You're gonna do it. That's super. Great. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm definitely. I, I'm always been fascinated. So I definitely want to. Try one of these days, but I guess it's uh, 
is something you really have to train for. I mean, you have no room for error, really. So, so you, I guess you really have to be careful. So, yeah. but, but it would be very exciting to see how much you can improve, actually. Mm, it's amazing. Nice. Yeah. Um, Carl, so, if people wanted, oh, sorry, Giuliano, there. I no, no, I just gonna say that soon I'll, I'll be training for Carol. <laughs> yes. And if people wanted to make contact with you, how would they find out about you? Do, what's your website or do you have Instagram or social media? Yeah, uh, they can find me at Instagram, uh, Carol Mayer Official, or at my website, Carol Mayer dot com dot br brazil and they will find me there <laughs> great great because you know we were in the space of breathing and it's funny daniel i haven't really gave the the free diving so much thought even though a lot of the the articles that we look yeah. at in terms of the breath holding are coming from the free dive community it's where a lot of the research on breath holding has originated from yeah um that there's a nice fit here. Yeah. And, and again, I think even though you see the hematocrit values go up and all the physiological changes, I think they're great. But I think the mental aspect, again, mm. and hard to measure, but I think those are substantial, both on a temporary basis when you alter your states, but also on a permanent basis when you get those states. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm deeply fascinated by it. Absolutely. So uh, we hope to learn more about that, uh, Caroline, in, in the future.